Donald says it only takes a spark to set a whole fire going. And once the fire was lit in one part of Europe, it spread quickly to other areas. John Wycliffe had made a massive impact, not just in England, but further afield in Europe, in particular here in Prague, and the region that was known then as Bohemia. John Huss was of humble birth, and his father died soon after he was born. His mother sought an education for him, and he was able to get admission to the University of Prague as a charity scholar. As she reached Prague with her son, she knelt down and prayed that God would bless his life, a prayer that was answered again and again. He soon distinguished himself by his tireless application to study and by his blameless life. Upon completing his studies, he entered the priesthood and rapidly rose to prominence, soon becoming attached to the court of the king. In a few short years, he was the pride of his country and his name was known all over Europe. Today, they've built a statue to commemorate him here in the Old Town Square. Several years after becoming a priest, Huss was appointed preacher of the Bethlehem Chapel here in Prague. The founder of this particular chapel had advocated as a matter of importance the preaching of the scriptures in the language of the people. At that time, there was a large degree of ignorance concerning the Bible, and Huss also believed that it was vitally important to preach the scriptures in the language of the people. At this point in his life, Huss came in contact with Jerome, who had proved to be his right-hand man until his death. Jerome was a citizen of Prague, and he had brought back with him from a recent trip to England the writings of John Wycliffe. The Queen of England at that time was also a convert of John Wycliffe, and she was a Bohemian princess, and through her influence, his writings were circulated at length in Bohemia. Huss read them, believed their author to be a sincere Christian, and believed the writings to be true. Huss's impact was growing, not just here in his homeland, but also in neighboring Germany. And soon news of the work here in Prague reached Rome, and he was summoned to appear before the Pope. To go would be fatal. The king and queen of Bohemia, the nobility and the government all asked for a local trial, but this was not granted. The trial of Huss went ahead in his absence, during which the city of Prague was put under interdict. This struck terror into the hearts of everyone. No church services could take place. Baptisms, funerals, weddings, those ceremonies that were so key to life in general were not allowed to take place. And through this means, Rome was able to hold sway over the people. The city was in turmoil, and Sir Huss withdrew to his native village, but he continued to travel to the surrounding countryside where he was able to preach to eager crowds. When the danger and excitement had subsided, he was able to return to Prague, where alongside with Jerome, he was able to continue his work. During this time in Europe, there was not one or two but three rival popes, all claiming to be the Vicar of Christ. This abuse of power in the church was something that many men strongly condemned, Huss being one of the loudest voices. The emperor at that time, Emperor Sigismund, called for a council in Constance, Germany, to settle this dispute once and for all, and also to deal with some of the new heresies arising from men such as John Huss that they didn't agree with. Huss was summoned to appear before the council and was given assurance of a safe passage by the emperor. One thing that stands out from this story is the prayer that John Huss's mum made with him as he was on his way to university. I want to encourage you, if you're praying for a child, if you're praying for a parent, to never give up in your prayers. The prayer of John Huss's mother was answered many, many times over in ways that she couldn't have even imagined. 
Maybe you're praying for your children, maybe they're on their way to school, maybe you're praying for a loved one. Keep them in prayer and never think that our prayers will go unanswered. God does hear and God does answer our prayers. Here in Constance, Germany, a council was convened in the year 1415. Three significant things took place. Firstly, it was called to discuss the schism between the popes. At that time, there wasn't one, nor two, but three rival popes, all declaring themselves to be the true and right pope. This council settled that schism and appointed someone who would rule after those three. It was also here where they declared the writings and John Wycliffe to be a heretic and ordered that his bones be exhumed and burned. It was also at this council where John Huss was ordered to appear to defend his teachings. When Huss left for Constance, he said goodbye to his friends as if he wasn't going to see them again even though he had a letter of safe passage from the emperor and the pope. Soon after arriving here in Constance, by order of the pope and the cardinals, he was thrust into prison. This building behind me, though today a nice hotel, was one of the places used to imprison John Huss whilst he was here in Constance. The trial of Huss took place here in Constance, in the Munster. It is said that he sat on aisle 24. He was asked if he wanted to recant, to which he said he would prefer death over recantation. He was thrown back in prison and brought back here again, and the last time he spoke at the trial, he fixed his eyes on the emperor and said that he had traveled here under his own free will and under the public protection of the emperor sat here. It is said that when everyone's eyes turned on Sigismund, that his face turned crimson red. Sitting here in aisle 24, where Huss sat during his trial, our minds go back to Jerome. When Huss left for Constance, Jerome told him that if he heard of any misfortune, he would come and help right away. Hearing of his imprisonment, he left and traveled down here, but without a safe passage. On arriving in Constance, he realized there was not anything he could do, and so he headed back to Prague, but he was captured on the way and brought back here to Constance. Some people wanted to kill him right away, but they put him in prison where he almost died for lack of food. They wanted to keep him alive. They realized that Huss's death hadn't accomplished very much, and so they wanted Jerome to recant. He was left in prison for about a year in terrible, terrible conditions. Suffering from doubt, he eventually renounced the teachings of Wycliffe, he renounced the teachings of Huss, and pledged to adhere to the Catholic faith. He went back to prison, but the council was not done with him. Either wanting more blood, or wanting a fuller and broader surrender of faith, they called him again, but this time he renounced his former recantation. He asked to address the house and this was denied, but he remonstrated and was given the opportunity to speak. He stood up and pledged his support of Huss and the influence he had had on his life. And he went on to say, of all the sins that I have committed since my youth, none weighs so heavily on my mind and cause me such poignant remorse as that which I committed in this fatal place when I approved of the iniquitous sentence rendered against Wycliffe and against the holy martyr John Huss, my master and my friend. Yes, I confess it from my heart and declare with horror that I disgracefully quailed when through a dread of death I condemned their doctrines. I therefore supplicate Almighty God to pardon me my sins, and this one in particular, the most heinous of all.
One thing we learn from the story of Huss and Jerome is that although at the end of his life Jerome fell away, he then came back. Maybe you have fallen away in your walk with the Lord. Maybe you've backslidden. Maybe you've done things that you wish you had never done. Jerome was once strong in his faith and fell away, but at the very end, he came back. There's always time for us to come back to God. If you've fallen down, the most important thing is that you get back up and renew your acquaintance with the Lord. Maybe today, if you've fallen away, you need to renew that acquaintance with God again. After Huss was delivered up to the secular authorities, he was asked one last time if he wanted to recant. What errors shall I renounce, he asked. I know myself guilty of none. He was brought to this very spot here in Constance and they burned him to death. They had to light the fire three times. They wanted to ensure his body was completely consumed. They dug up his ashes along with the soil under him and threw it into the Rhine River. About a year later, Jerome was also brought to this same spot. And as his executioner was standing behind him, Jerome said, apply the fire before my face. Had I been afraid, I should not have been here. They died with heroic bearing. And a zealous papist commenting on the death of Huss and Jerome said these words. Both bore themselves with constant mind when their last hour approached. They prepared for the fire as if they were going to a marriage feast. They uttered no cry of pain. When the flames rose, they began to sing hymns and scarce could the vehemency of the fire stop their singing. Both these men lived their lives 100% for God, so that when they died, as tragic as it was, they died with no regrets. If we live our lives today 100% for God, fully surrendered to Him, we also can live a life where we have no regrets. execution of Hassan Jerome had caused a national uproar back in Bohemia. He was believed to have been a faithful teacher, and as is often the case, now that he was dead, his writings attracted an even greater interest. The Hussite Wars commenced about four years after the death of Hassan Jerome in the year 1419. As Pope and Emperor united to crush the Hussite movement, the Lord raised up a deliverer. Ziska was one of the most able generals of his age and was the leader of the Bohemians. He had lost sight in one eye during a battle in 1410, and later in his life, he would lose sight in the other eye as well, but he would still lead his armies into battle after battle without losing. He is one of the few generals about whom it can be said never lost a battle in war. He was a military genius and is credited with inventing an early form of the tank. They were called war wagons and they were wooden boxes that were reinforced with steel on wagon wheels. And he would send these into battle with people inside and load them with cannons and crossbows and pistols. 
despite having mainly peasants as soldiers, with the use of clever war tactics and with providence on their side, the Hussite armies were able to repel the numerically larger and better trained papal armies. Giscu would fight over 250 battles in his lifetime and would withstand two full papal crusades against him, but he was not to die on the battlefield. Instead, he would fall victim to the Black Plague. But before he would die, he gave his men some instructions, telling them he still wanted to go with them onto the battlefield. He told his men to make a drum out of his skin, which they did. And they took this drum made with Jiska's skin and would beat it as they went into battle. His place was filled by Procopius, who was a skillful and brave leader, and in some aspects, a more able general. The enemies of the Bohemians, knowing that the blind warrior was now dead, thought they would now be able to win. The Pope launched another crusade against the Bohemians in 1427, where he was defeated. He then launched another crusade where he was defeated again. In 1431, under a new pope, a fifth crusade was launched, but once again, the papal armies were soundly defeated by the Hussite forces. Realizing that they couldn't conquer by force, they resorted to diplomacy. A compromise was entered into that while appearing to offer freedom of conscience, really betrayed them into the power of Rome. The Bohemians had specified four points as a condition of peace with Rome, and these were the free preaching of the Bible, the right of the whole church to both the bread and the wine in the communion, the use of the mother tongue in divine worship, the exclusion of the clergy from all secular offices and authority, and in cases of crime, the jurisdiction of the civil courts over clergy and laity alike. At last, the papal authorities agreed to accept the four Hussite articles, but that the right of explaining them, that is of determining their precise import, should rest with the council, that is with the emperor and the pope. On this basis, a treaty was entered into, and Rome gained by dissimulation and fraud what she had failed to gain by conflict. For in placing her own interpretation upon the articles, as upon the Bible, she could pervert their meaning to suit her own ends. Oftentimes, when Satan is not able to defeat us through open confrontation, he tries the tactic of compromise. It's something he's done repeatedly throughout history and throughout the Bible. May we be careful, wise and discerning, and most of all, resolute, and that we stand for God through whatever tactic Satan uses against us, whether it's confrontation or whether it's compromise, and that we may always stand for God. Thirty years after the death of Wycliffe, at the Council of Constance in Germany, he was declared to be a heretic. A decree was made to dig up his bones and burn them to ashes. At that time, the Bishop of Lincoln was a former friend of his and he delayed in acting on this request for five years. He moved out the area and the next one who came in also vacillated for eight years before finally succumbing to this demand and dug up the bones and burned them. After burning his bones, they threw the ashes into the River Swift. But the significance of this gruesome act and the symbolism it would come to later represent, they could not have imagined. The River Swift flows into the River Avon. The River Avon flows into the Bristol Channel. 
and the Bristol Channel eventually flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And so symbolically, the effect of his work spread around the whole world. He is called the morning star of the Reformation because he was the beginning in a chain of events that once started became unstoppable. John Wycliffe gave to the Christian church perhaps the greatest gift possible, the Bible. And once given, the light would begin to shine and the darkness would be peeled away. John Wycliffe's work is key in our Christian heritage, for at the center of our faith is the Bible. Never underestimate the extent of the work that you do. John Wycliffe was called here to Lutterworth, a small, quiet country town, or probably back then, just a village. If any of us were called here to this town today, we might think it's not good enough, or not big enough, or not prestigious enough but he faithfully did the work that God had called him to do and gave to the Christian church perhaps the greatest gift possible. Wherever you are, use the gifts and the talents that God has given you, for you never know how far your influence may spread. Every so often, a technological invention comes along that changes everything about the way we live. If you were born in this millennium, it's likely you only know a world where there have been smartphones, the internet, and satellite TV. These things are as much a part of life today as putting our shoes on in the morning when we leave the house or eating breakfast first thing in the day. Those who are a little older though will remember a world where there was no social media, where the internet was very slow or non-existent and the idea of taking a photograph on your mobile phone was mind-boggling. Video chat seemed way distant in the future and yet today these things are considered normal and a part of life. There was a time where if you wanted to read something then it would have been handwritten by someone else. Books were expensive and hard to come by. The materials were costly. Monks would write on treated skins called vellum and a single copy of the Bible would require 300 sheepskins or 170 calfskins. Most people could not read and the majority of books were in Latin, a language that only the most educated could understand. In the 15th century, the printing press came along and revolutionized the world of literature, fundamentally changing the way that we communicate as it enabled the fast flow of information and led to the quick spread of new ideas. Once text could be reproduced quickly, people had access to read books that they didn't have before. A previously illiterate populace now turned into a more educated and inquisitive one. The printing press was invented by a German goldsmith by the name of Johannes Gutenberg. The exact date of his birth is not known as he was not a famous man during his lifetime, but it is believed he finished working on the printing press at around the year 1440. The first book to be published in several volumes and multiple copies was the Bible in 1452. The Gutenberg Bibles would prove to be immensely popular, with all 200 copies of them being sold before the copying was even complete. This was 65 years before Martin Luther published his 95 Theses, and while he was able to preach to only a relatively small number of people, the printed page would reach thousands of people in a short space of time and across national borders. With books being translated from Latin into other languages, people naturally began to ask why was mass still being conducted in Latin? 
People began to ask why church service were not conducted in the language that members of society, regardless of their wealth or education, could actually understand. Gutenberg's printing press meant more access to information, more detailed discussion, and more widespread criticism of the authorities. As such, the printing press popularized ideas associated with the Protestant faith during the Reformation, allowing the press to shape and channel a mass movement. The printing press removed control of written material from the Catholic Church and made it difficult for the Church to inhibit the spread of ideas that they regarded as heretical. Had it not been for Gutenberg's invention, the news of Luther's revolutionary ideas would not have spread as quickly as they did. Today God has given us technology that we can use to spread ideas very quickly. May we use the talents we have, the gifts we have, and the technology we have to spread the news of Jesus to the world today.